Chapter One, Part One of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter One In the Valley, Part One. A young officer in dingy Confederate gray rode slowly on a powerful bay horse through a forest of oak. It was a noble woodland, clear of undergrowth, the fine trees standing in rows like those of a park. They were bare of leaves, but the winter had been mild so far, and a carpet of short grass, yet green, covered the ground. To the rider's right flowed a small river of clear water one of the beautiful streams of the great virginia valleys harry kenton threw his head back a little and drew deep breaths of the cool crisp air the light wind had the touch of life in it as the cool puffs blew upon him and filled his lungs his chest expanded and his strong pulses beat more strongly but a boy in years he had already done a man's work and he had been through those deeps of passion and despair which war alone brings a year spent in the open and with few nights under roof had enlarged harry kenton's frame and had colored his face a deep red his great ancestor henry ware had been very fair and harry like him became scarlet of cheek under the beat of wind and rain had any one with a discerning eye been there to see, he would have called this youth one of the finest types of the South that rode forth so boldly to war. He sat his saddle with the ease and grace that come only of long practice, and he controlled his horse with the slightest touch of the rein. The open, frank face showed hate of nobody although the soul behind it was devoted without any reserve to the cause for which he fought. Harry was on scout duty. Although an officer on the staff of Colonel Talbot, commander of the Invincibles, originally a South Carolina regiment, he had developed so much skill in forest and field, he had such acuteness of eye and ear, that he was sent often to seek the camps of the enemy or to discover his plans. His friends said that these forest powers were inherited, that they came from some faraway ancestor who had spent his life in the wilderness, and Harry knew that what they said was true. Despite the peaceful aspect of the forest and the lack of human presence, save his own, he rode now on an errand that was full of danger. The Union camp must lie on the other side of that little river not many miles farther on, and he might meet, at any moment, the pickets of the foe. He meant to take the uttermost risk, but he had no notion of being captured. He would suffer anything, any chance, rather than that. He had lately come into contact with a man who had breathed into him the fire and spirit belonging to legendary heroes. To this man, Short of words and plain of dress, nothing was impossible, and Harry caught from him not merely the belief, but the conviction also. Late in the autumn, the Invincibles, who had suffered severely at Bull Run and afterward had been cut down greatly in several small actions in the mountains, had been transferred to the command of Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. Disease and the hospital had reduced the regiment to less than three hundred, but their spirits were as high as ever. Their ranks were renewed partly with Virginians. Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire had recovered from small wounds, and St. Clair and Langdon were whole and as hard as iron. After a period of waiting, they were now longing for action. There was some complaint among the Invincibles when they were detached from the main army to the service of Jackson, but Harry did not share in it. When he heard of the order, 
he remembered that dread afternoon at bull run when all seemed lost and the most vivid of his memories was the calm figure riding back and forth just beyond the pines among which he stood and gathering for a fresh charge the stern ranks of his men who were to turn almost sure defeat into absolutely sure victory the picture of the man in the heart of that red glare among the showers of bullets had been burned so deeply into harry's memory that he could call it up almost as vivid as life itself at any time surely that was a leader to follow and he at least would wish to ride where stonewall led but action did not come as soon as he had expected jackson was held by commands from richmond the great army of the south waited because the great army of the north under mcclellan also waited and temporized while the autumn was passing fast but jackson while held in the bonds of orders did not sleep the most active youth of his command rode day and night toward the northern end of the valley where the forces of the union were gathering the movements of banks and kelly and the other northern commanders were watched continually by keen eyes trained in the southern forests slim striplings passed in the night through the little towns and the people intensely loyal to the south gave them the news of everything harry had seen the whole autumn pass and winter come and the war save for a fitful skirmish now and then stood at a pause in the valley yet he rode incessantly both with the others and alone on scouting duty he knew every square mile of the country over a wide range and he had passed whole nights in the forest when hail or snow was whistling by but these had been few mostly mild winds blew and the hoofs of his horse fell on green turf harry was intensely alert now he was far from his command and he knew that he must see and hear everything or he would soon be in the hands of the enemy he rode on rather slowly and amid continued silence he saw on his left a white house with green shutters and a portico but the shutters were closed tightly and no smoke rose from the chimneys although house and grounds showed no touch of harm they seemed to bear the brand of desolation the owners had fled knowing that the sinister march of war would pass here harry's mood changed suddenly from gladness to depression the desolate house brought home to him the terrible nature of war it meant destruction wounds and death and they were all the worse because it was a nation divided against itself people of the same blood and the same traditions fighting one another but youth cannot stay gloomy long and his spirits presently flowed back there was too much tang and life in that crisp wind from the west for his body to droop and a lad could not be sad long with brilliant sunshine around him and that shining little river before him the thrill of high adventure shot up from his soul he had ceased to hate the northern soldiers if he had ever hated them at all now they were merely brave opponents with whom he contended and success demanded of either skill daring and energy to the utmost degree he was resolved not to fail in any of these qualities he left the desolate house a mile behind and then the river curved a little the woods on the farther shore came down in dense masses to the edge of the stream and despite the lack of foliage harry could not see far into them the strong inherited instincts leaped up his nostrils expanded and a warning note was sounded somewhere in the back of his brain he turned his horse to the left and entered the forest on his own side of the river they were ancient trees that he rode among with many drooping and twisted boughs and he was concealed well although he could yet see from his covert the river and the forest on the other shore the song of a trumpet suddenly came from the deep woodland across the shining stream 
it was a musical song mellow and triumphant on every key and the forest and hills on either shore gave it back soft and beautiful on its dying echoes it seemed to harry that the volume of sound rounded and full must come from a trumpet of pure gold he had read the old romances of the round table and for the moment his head was full of them some knight in the thicket was sending forth a challenge to him but harry gave no answering defiance now the medieval glow was gone and he was modern and watchful to the core he had felt instinctively that it was a trumpet of the foe and the northern trumpets were not likely to sing there in virginia unless many northern horsemen rode together then he saw their arms glinting among the trees the brilliant beams of the sun dancing on the polished steel of saber hilt and rifle barrel a minute more and three hundred union horsemen emerged from the forest and rode in beautiful order down to the edge of the stream harry regarded them with an admiration which was touched by no hate they were heavily built strong young men riding powerful horses and it was easy for anyone to see that they had been drilled long and well their clothes and arms were in perfect order every horse had been tended as if it were to be entered in a ring for a prize it was his thought that they were not really enemies but worthy foes that ancient spirit of the tournament where men strove for the sake of striving came to him again the union horsemen rode along the edge of the stream a little space and then plunged into a ford the water rose to their saddle skirts but they preserved their even line and harry still admired when all were on his own shore the golden trumpet sang merrily again and they turned the heads of their horses southward harry rode deeper into the ancient wood they might throw out scouts or skirmishers and he had no mind to be taken it was his belief that they came from romney where a northern army had gathered in great force and would eventually march toward jackson at winchester but whatever their errand here was something for him to watch and he meant to know what they intended the northern troops youths also the average of their age not much more than twenty rode briskly along the edge of the little river which was a shining one for them too as well as harry they knew that no enemy in force was near and they did not suspect that a single horseman followed keeping in the edge of the woods his eyes missing nothing that they did as for themselves they were in the open now and the brilliant sunshine quickened their blood some of them had been at bull run but the sting of that day was going with time they were now in powerful force at the head of the great virginia valleys and they would sweep down them with such impact that nothing could stand before them the trumpet sang its mellow triumphant note again and from across a far range of hills came its like a low mellow note faint almost an echo but a certain reply it was the answer from another troop of their men who rode on a parallel line several miles away the lone lad in the edge of the forest heard the distant note also but he gave it no heed his eyes were always for the troop before him he had already learned from stonewall jackson that you cannot do two things at once but the one thing that you do you must do with all your might the troop presently left the river and entered the fields from which the crops had been reaped long since when the horsemen came to a fence twelve men dismounted and threw down enough panels for the others to ride through without breaking their formation everything was done with order and precision harry could not keep from admiring it was not often that he saw so early in the war troops who were drilled so beautifully and who marched so well together 
Harry always kept on the far side of the fields, and as the fences were of rails with stakes and riders, he was able by bending very low in the saddle to keep hidden behind them. Nevertheless, it was delicate work. He was sure that if seen, he could escape to the forest through the speed of his horse, but he did not want to be driven off. He wished to follow that troop to its ultimate destination. Another mile or two, and the Union force bore away to the right, entering the forest and following a road where the men rode in files, six abreast. They did not make much noise beyond the steady beating of the hoofs, but they did not seem to seek concealment. Harry made the obvious deduction that they thought themselves too far beyond the range of the southern scouts to be noticed. He felt a thrill of satisfaction because he was there and he had seen them. He rode in the forest parallel with the troop and at a distance of about 400 yards. There was scattered undergrowth, enough to hide him, but not enough to conceal those 300 men who rode in close files along a well-used road. Harry soon saw the forest thinning ahead of him, and then the trumpet sang its mellow golden note again. From a point, perhaps a mile ahead, came a reply, also the musical call of the trumpet. Not an echo, but the voice of a second trumpet, and now Harry knew that another force was coming to join the first. All his pulses began to beat hard, not with nervousness, but with intense eagerness to know what was afoot. Evidently, it must be something of importance, or strong bodies of Union cavalry would not be meeting in the woods in this manner. After the reply, neither trumpet sounded again, and the troop that Harry was following stopped while yet in the woods. He rode his horse behind a tall and dense clump of bushes where, well hidden, he could yet see all that might happen, and waited. He heard in a few minutes the beat of many hoofs upon the hard road, advancing with the precision and regularity of trained cavalry. He saw the head of a column emerge upon the road and an officer ride forward to meet the commander of the first troop. They exchanged a few words, and then the united force rode southward through the open woods, with the watchful lad always hanging on their rear. Harry judged that the new troop numbered about 500 men, and 800 cavalry would not march on any mere scouting expedition. His opinion that this was a ride of importance now became a conviction, and he hardened his purpose to follow them to the end, no matter what the risk. End of Chapter 1, Part 1 Recording by Lucretia B.